of the new Black Panther Party, Mazik Zulu Shabazz. Let's give Brother Conrad another black hand. And the Nation of Islam, another black hand. And yourselves, give yourselves a black hand. Black power. Black power. Black power. Giving honor to God, we bear witness that regardless to land, label, or language, we bear witness that there is but one God. We thank that God for giving us Harriet Tubman, a bold black woman. We thank that God for giving us Reverend Nat Turner, a bold black man. We thank that God for giving to us the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. We thank that God for giving us a little bold black man from right here in Sandersville, Georgia, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. All praise is due to Allah. We thank that God for giving to us Minister Malcolm X, Frederick Douglass, the Black Panthers from the 1960s. We thank that God for Medgar Evers, Emmett Till. But if I live to be a thousand or the ripe old age of Methuselah, I could never thank God enough for a bold, bald-headed black man, Khalid Abdul Muhammad. Let me say this briefly. I'm not going to be long, but I got to be strong. As we are here as a graduate of a black college, and a graduate of a black college law school, Howard University and Howard University School of Law, I say to you black students here at Clark, Atlanta, and Spelman and Morehouse, that when black college students rise up in the liberation struggle, then the end of our enemy's world is at hand. I say to you black college students, don't give your degree, your time, and your life to building up your enemy's world. If you're going to be a lawyer, be a revolutionary lawyer, a revolutionary doctor, a revolutionary student dedicated to our eyes. Brothers and sisters, you didn't come out here tonight to hear from the lion leaders of the United States. I mean the United States government. You came to hear from a bold black man. You didn't come out here. Did you come out here tonight to hear from Dick Cheney? Did you come out here to hear from Condoleezza Rice? Did you come out here to hear from Colin Powell? Did you come out here to hear from old no good George W. Bush? Who did you come to hear from? Who did you come to hear from? We want to hear tonight from a man who God is backing to make his word bond. He is a man that called for one million black men and two million black men show up. This is a man that we are about to bring on that is feared by the white man. This is a man, how many of us? can testify that when we were down or depressed or in a bind, that we heard a Farrakhan tape, that a word from Farrakhan in our home, in our lives, reached into our lives, reached down into that home where we are and lifted us up. How many will testify? As we prepare to bring him on, let me say this at this reparations conference, 150 million African murdered, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, on the charges of murder. How do you find the white man? Yeah. On the charges of robbery, robbing our names, our language, our religion, our culture, our God. On the charges of robbery, how do you find the white man? Yeah. On the charges of police brutality, how do you find the white man? on the charges of political prisoners locking up Malachi York, 
locking up Imam Jamil al Amin. How do you find them on political prisoners? On assassinating black leaders, killing black leaders. How do you find them? How do you find them? What is the sentence? What is the sentence? As I prepare to bring him on, Minister Fo you know I'm going to get crunk up here. I got to do it. Minister Farrakhan has said, as he is bringing millions of black men and women to Washington, that the government and the enemy may try to kill him. We say tonight that if you lay a hand on Louis Farrakhan, that what you saw at the Fulton County Courthouse a couple of weeks ago will look like nothing. All of this will go up in smoke. I present to you the apostle of the messenger of God, the convener of the Million Man March 2005, our spiritual father and the dean of the Black Liberation Movement, the Honorable, the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. Black Power, Assalamu Alaikum. All right, y'all, slow down. Very quickly, the students would not allow me, Minister, to get out of Atlanta alive if they didn't present you with what they feel you deserve. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, the students here at Clark Atlanta University wanted you to, pre to present you with a plaque with our school seal, with Atlanta University, which was established in 1865, with the sword, and the Clark College in 1869, with our land, oh, I'm so <laughs> 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 with our land. with our school symbol, which was the lamp, which means that our students are the light of the world, our school models, Clark Colleges, which is a culture for service, and Atlanta Universities, which we have adopted here at Clark Atlanta University, which is I'll find a way or make one. We present to the Indaba Fifth Conference, the student body of Clark Atlanta University recognizes the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan for 50 years of service sacrifice and struggle as an exceptional role model in international leadership we thank you for your non-compromising efforts to secure reparations for black people in america presented this 19th day of march 2005 at the fifth indaba conference we are so delighted to have you here making history at our illustrious university and we are so proud to present you with this award and we are honored to have you in our midst. Thank you. Go ahead, so get, get, get a picture. All right, uh, Brother Minister. This is the Underground Railroad Award. It comes deep out of Louisiana, and this sister told me that if she didn't, if I didn't give you this quilt tonight, she was going to take me out the game. So I want to read to you the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I do not want to be taken out the game by no sister from Louisiana who looked like she could take a brother out the game. There are a lot of sisters you ever met. The minister and I were talking about when we went to Libya one time and we saw some of the women that guard Qaddafi, they could take you out the game, brother. So this quilt that represents the connection of African people and all the bones and tributaries 
to pay homage to all the ones and the ones that made my path a smoother road to travel, I give to you the Honorable Minister Louis Parkham. My country tears of thee. This statement states here in the United States of America, a crime was committed, a black holocaust, where my ancestors were lynched, burned, castrated, and tortured with no justice. Yet we still celebrate the European holidays and learn his story. Until we learn who we are, we will never be free. I did not come this far in my lifetime to bow down. I came to conquer what is not of or for me. Asante Sana and the sisters in the audience, and she's so bad, she don't even want you to see who she is, but she presents this to you tonight, Minister. Thank you. Thank you. I love you too. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, we give him praise and thanks for sending into the world his prophets and messengers to give us a greater knowledge of him and the secrets of the majesty of his universe. We thank him for Moses and the Torah or the Old Testament. We thank him for Jesus and the Injil or Gospel or New Testament. We thank him for Muhammad and the Holy Quran. Peace be upon these worthy servants of God. I am a student of the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I could never thank Allah enough for his intervention in our affairs in the person of Master Farad Muhammad who came to North America and found the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, a man born in Sandersville, Georgia under the name Elijah Poo. And he taught this man for three years and approximately four months and gave him the name Muhammad and started him on the road to raising the black man of America and black people of the world up from the mental chains of slavery and death that had been imposed on us by our former slave masters and their children. I greet all of you, my dear brothers and sisters, with the greeting words of peace. We say it in the Arabic language, Assalamu Alaikum, but it means in English, peace be unto you. First, let me say how honored I am to have received these tributes and awards that you may think don't mean much to a man who has received so many. But I'm especially touched to receive an award from this great Atlanta University complex and Clark University, its students. And I want to thank the students.
I want to thank the students and their faculty advisors and the president of this university for permitting Indaba 5 to be here on this campus. I'm also moved by my sister, who I don't see, I, I don't know, that wrote those beautiful words and sent me this beautiful quilt. I am honored to receive such. And as I was receiving these wonderful honors from you, my thoughts went to the many who have paid the ultimate price that we might be here today. We thank God for every man, every woman, and every child that has died struggling for us and those who died as a result of the wickedness of our oppressors. But I want to say to us that no life is lost in vain. Every life is precious. Every black life is precious. And even those that are dying in the senseless violence in the streets of America are teaching us lessons from their graves that the madness among us must cease. I thank Brother Attorney Chairman Malik Zulu Shabazz for his wonderful introduction of me. Where is my brother? Where is my brother? And uh, I kind of feel, uh, Brother Malik, I feel comforted by your presence because I feel my brother Khaled by my side again. I am honored by all of my helpers and ministers and, and all of you who are fighting so hard for reparations and all of you who fill this auditorium tonight. I have not been feeling as well as I would like. Somehow this flu bug got a hold to me, but I was determined that I should come out here tonight and uh, I'll be at the mosque inshallah tomorrow and I shall meet with the clergy on Monday but I feel you know Atlanta is a very special place with some very special people the south will give birth to a new black America, the South. You may not think much of the South, but the greater the oppression, the greater the leadership that's birthed out of that oppression to deliver the oppressed. And that's why Martin Luther King came from Georgia. And that's why Elijah Muhammad came from Georgia. And that's why Joe Lowry and all the great Hosea Williams and all of the great strugglers, male and female, coming up out of Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Texas, Louisiana, Florida. Yeah. So I'm very happy to be in the South. When I first came here, 
at the invitation of Minister Jeremiah Shabazz. Oh, well, that was about a long time ago. And uh, Etta James was in the audience as I was speaking that night. And Etta James accepted the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that night. But when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad heard that I was here in Georgia, he told me, get the first thing smoking and get out of here. Because I guess my fiery way of delivery might get me and a whole lot of other people killed. But today is a new day. Today, today is a day that black men and women in Georgia and Alabama, Mississippi can stand tall because it is not the white man as much as it is our fear of the white man that keeps us from making progress. And if you're afraid of him, then his very presence will stifle your words and impede your actions and cripple your thoughts. But when you can say, I fear no one but God, then you are free for the first time in your life. Money will not make you unafraid. Because I've met a lot of fearful millionaires and a few fearful billionaires. Education and the finest degrees won't take fear out of your hearts. Having successful business won't take fear out of your heart. Any man that's afraid is a man not free. And that is why the scripture says, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. What, what truth is it? The greatest knowledge of all is the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. Those two knowledges are really the same knowledge, if you understand. When you know God, you know yourself. And when you know yourself, you know God because you came from God and the divine essence of God is within each and every one of us. Listen to me carefully. The Bible could not teach you that God created us in his image and likeness and then we don't reflect him. See, I noticed the language today. Yo, dog. What up, dog? See, God spelled backwards is dog. Man brought low is dog. Man resurrected is a reflection of God. And when you know God, you lose your fear of man. And when you know yourself and God, you've got a passport then to go as high as you desire to go. There is no white man. There is no power 
in the heavens above or in the earth below that can stop you from achieving what you desire if you get fear out of your heart and take your own foot out of your way. You are the stumbling block in the pathway of your progress. And the moment you know God and you know yourself, the white man becomes who he is. Now, what do you mean, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? There was a man that came to Jesus. And Jesus asked him, how do you see men? He said, oh, I see them as trees. Well, Jesus knew that the boy wasn't seeing right. So he took a little spittle and rubbed it on the man's eyes. And he said, how do you see men? He said, oh, now I see them as they are. The children of Israel were promised a promised land. The beloved Martin Luther King said, I've been to the mountaintop and I have seen not the promised sky. I've seen the promised land. He said, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. Now, wait, wait, wait. <coughs> Excuse me. But the promised land had some giants in it. And the children of Israel, after God showed them his power, got them out of Egypt, drowned Pharaoh's army, got them in the wilderness, spied out the promised land. They came back there, there's some giants over there. And God said, well, go ahead in there. You know, you, you, you can take it. He said, not us. We ain't going. Maybe you and Moses and Aaron, y'all go in and take Joshua with you. And when you all clean out the giants, then come back and get us. So the God looked at them and said, man, you mean to tell me? After I knocked Pharaoh down, Drowned his army in the Red Sea. Brought you out of Egypt and fed you in the wilderness. You were afraid of some giants in the land? He said, well, then I'm going to let you old folks wander in the wilderness till you die out. And I'm going to take your children and they will inhabit the promised land. There's something about old folks. And I want you to hear me now. You know, I'm an old folk. But I'm a young man. You know, it, you know nobody older than God and nobody fresher. He's fresh in every generation. Age is not a number. It's a state, a decrepit state of mind. Now I'm talking to old folks now. <laughs> old folks are those that are shaped by the rulers of the old world and its way of civilization. We have literally come to the end of Caucasian time to rule the world. Their time to rule is up. They know this. 
but they also know that you don't know that it is your time. So they want to keep you boogieing, shaking, shake your booty. See, booty in your face, brother, stop your progressive thought. We just forgot about reparation. Because sister's so fine, if she put on the phone and go to dancing, Bible sit down, Quran sit down, reparation out the window. So the enemy got you dancing? Partying, smoking dope, looking for pleasure, so he can continue a corrupt and unjust rule. You students represent the future of our people. AU is not designed to prepare you. <clears throat> no, listen to me. It's designed to educate you to fit into the paradigm that is theirs where you cannot give them trouble. When you are truly educated, you think outside the box of Western education and you think like a free man and a free woman. How many of you in this audience have been affected by Brother Malcolm Shabazz, raise your hands. He only went to the eighth grade. <laughs> How many of you have been affected by his teacher, Donald B. Elijah Muhammad? He only went to the fourth grade. Now, what is it about an eighth grade student and a fourth grade student that shook up the world and you with a PhD cannot shake up even your community? We have to face reality. It was never the intention of your former slave masters to truly educate you, for to educate you truly would make you free of his rule, his power, his domination, and his oppression. When Howard University was established, one of the finest black uh, colleges in America. They said there were three things in Congress that they would never teach black people. Three things. One, the science of business. I didn't say they wouldn't teach you business administration and give you a BS, a BS. An MS or an MBA. They got that 
covered. But the science of business is the science of life itself. Why aren't black people doing business? Every creature gets for itself. You don't find a black bird in a line looking to big bird to find it some worms. Every creature knows how to extract from this creation what it needs to build a house for itself, to feed itself, and to protect itself from its enemies. But you, with all our degrees, we have millions of black men and women out of work and they're looking to the white man. Well, let me get my picket sign. Let's march. White folk ain't giving me a job. I'm mad. And with all the education that you're supposed to have, you asking him? to make a job for you? You asking him to build a house for you? You asking him to farm for you? So we have not been taught the science of business. You've been taught accounting so you can be a CPA in his firm You've been taught business management so you can manage his business, but very little of your own. Then the second thing he said he would never teach black people is the science of warfare. Because if you know the science of business, you have to have the science of warfare to protect business. See, no creature is unaware of its enemy. Mama teaching the little one, look out for that, because that's your natural enemy. I have some cats and dogs at our farm and I watch the little baby cat. When the dog comes by, you see it get up and his back hunches up. I said, boy, at that age, it knows its enemy. What happened to you? Didn't life teach you yet? Didn't your reality teach you yet? And you will trade a friend for an enemy as long as the enemy smiles at you, offers you his daughter or his son. No white woman on your arm is payment for the damage done in the black holocaust. No intermarriage is payment. So, here was black men who were naturally gifted in the science of warfare. Toussaint 
L'ouverture didn't go to military school, but 60,000 of Napoleon's finest, 30,000 of them were wiped out by the tactics of Toussaint L'ouverture. And Haiti, right now, is still paying for whipping Napoleon's behind. Hannibal. Genghis Khan. They study Genghis Khan in military school. But a Negro in the West must never learn military science so that he will always be at the mercy of his open enemy. Come on. Wake us up. And the last thing that they said they would never teach us is the science of mating. You notice how rich white folks, they select other rich white folks. It's not an accident that Senator Kerry married Miss Hines. That's mating. See, they know how to pr produce thoroughbred horses. Pettigreed. Dogs, but don't teach Negroes the science of mating. See, we mate from the navel down. White folks mate from the neck up. And incidentally, then down comes into play. But down don't guide this. But us, sister, you see a cute brother. <laughs> Ain't he cute? But cute, you find out don't pay them bills, do they, baby? <laughs> Brother, you see this pretty girl, and you say, man, you tell your roommate, man, she is sure enough fine. She's shaped like a Coca-Cola bottle, baby. I'm in love. She's so sweet. Yeah, she's sweet, all right. But six months into the marriage, sweet have turned bitter. Because no woman can be sweet on a man that refuses to develop into a man. And there's nothing at Morehouse, nothing at Clark, nothing at Spelman that trains a woman and a man to be what God created us to be. You know how to type. You know how to do this. You know how to do that. But you don't know how to treat one another. You don't know how to choose the right one for you. You don't know how to rear children and make a great nation of people. So this is just happens to, hey baby, how you doing? Let's get it on. Oh damn, she's pregnant. Well, it was one of them things, you know what I mean? She say I'm pregnant. Well, what you gonna do about it? But he sure don't want no responsibility. Damn, I thought you was protecting yourself. 
Well, I thought you was protecting yourself and me too. Now the unwanted child is present, interfering with your plans. Growing up warehoused in all of these so-called institutions that look after children. There's hardly a child that is not being abused. There's hardly a female in this audience who doesn't know abuse. How in the hell can a woman grow to love a man when her own father, her own uncle, her own grandfather, her own brother is misusing her? So you want to know why women don't want to be around men today? You want to know why women find more comfort with another woman? You want to know why men would rather be on the down low? Because they can't handle a woman. It takes wisdom to handle a woman properly. And when you don't have wisdom, you cannot handle a woman with your fists. So now let's talk about reparation. Tell me something. You know, I know, we know the government owes us. And we're going to press them for what they owe. But don't be stupid. The dollar is falling faster than a penny dropped from the Empire State Building falling at 32 feet per second per second. America is borrowing money to pursue the mad policy of the Bush administration. $300 million raped from the treasury to pursue an unjust, immoral war. Asia has more dollars than America has. And if the Asians ask for the reality of what they have, the, they can collapse the American economy. Right now, Korea is trading some of her dollars for euros. That's right. That's right. That's right. And the dollar is sinking against the euro and the yen and the mark. So if the enemy said, come on, Negros, we recognize we've done you wrong. We've done you wrong. We've done you wrong. We've given all you Negros $100,000. And thank you for building my country. Thank you for your 300 years of free labor. Thank you, Negros. I mean, Negros, for fighting our wars. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thirty years ago, you could buy a Lincoln Continental for less than $8,000. So what is 100000 today? You can't even buy one of the top Mercedes Benz. Your 100000 gone if you want to ride a Benz and then can't pay for the gas. <laughs> so a fool and his money So don't, don't let Congress and don't let no punctified man speak up for you when it come time to negotiate. 
Now this is the thing that if you don't know what you're doing, you better get the hell away from that. Because this is serious. Your people will kill you for putting up the wrong figures. So none of you half-baked Negroes can speak for the hurt of a people that you don't even feel yourself. When it come time to negotiate, it ain't about dollars as much as it is about land. I want you to listen to me good. To my young student brothers and sisters, it's really nice to come out of college with a degree in music. <coughs> We've always <coughs> been good singers and dancers and players. And certainly you can always get a job making rich folk happy with your non-threatening degree. It's nice for you to get a degree in sociology and psychology and theater and physical education. Because we've always had Negroes with big, strong backs and muscles and, and if they want to be physically fit, well, we don't need them now to tote that barge and lift that bale, but we need to get a lot of them niggas hooked on dope and sent to jail. So. Those are degrees that are non-threatening. So liberal arts colleges are fine. Let's fund liberal arts. Because the Negro is going to try to be a lawyer, bless his heart. And the Negro is going to practice my style of medicine, but I'm killing him before he even gets there with debt. You're a slave before you leave college. By the time you leave college, they can present you with a bill that knocks you on your behind before you can even get up off the ground. America should give every black man and woman free education all the way to the doctorate degree. to deprive us of the human right to know for 300 years against the law to teach a black man how to read. So open up the doors there. If you want to help us repair the damage, we'll take what you give, but we'll augment it with a serious black studies course. Black studies cannot be translated into money unless you know what you're doing. But science, mathematics, all forms of engineering keep the Negroes out of that. Because once they become mathematicians, they think on another level, then they can trouble the waters because civilization is built on mathematics. When you don't know mathematics, then you become the servant of the mathematician upon which civilization is built. Science and technology build.
Well, we're going to send you to theological cemeteries. I mean, <laughs> seminaries, pardon me. <laughs> to the dear students of ITC, listen to me good. The Bible says God created the heavens and the earth with wisdom. The Holy Quran says he created the heavens and the earth with truth. We live in a mathematical science creation. You yourself are a mathematical scientific creation. And this body can only be upkept by science and mathematics. Mathematics in what you choose to put in. Mathematics in the measurement of what you put in to affect any disease that you may have. So when religion conflicts with mathematics, it is not mathematics that is wrong. It is religion that has to be brought into con a, a reconciliation with science and mathematics. Farrakhan, are you against religion? Of course not. I love theology. I'm a student of it. But when you take scripture and learn how to use it, it's high science. It is not entertainment. It is high science. You can't even interpret the scripture without a knowledge of science. In the beginning, Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And he separated the light from the darkness, and one part he called day, and the other part he called night. And he said, ah, this is good. There's high science in that. People talk about, do you believe in creation theory? Or do you believe in evolution? I believe in both. How did you start? The Holy Quran says you started from sperm mixed with ovum, then a clot, then an embryo then a fetus, then he brought you forth out of the darkness of your mother's womb, complete yet incomplete. That's evolution. We are all evolving toward God, evolving toward perfection. God has evolved creation. This is why when we use the term Lord in Islam, we use an Arabic word Rab, which means he who originates the creation, then makes it attain stage after stage until it reaches its eventual perfection. So God is both creator and evolver of all things toward perfection. Well, now, those of you in theology, you must not come out of this course teaching your people in a way that it is more entertainment than real scriptural science. If you're going to teach theology, teach it 
in a way that enlivens the spirit. Now, I know this is a talk on reparations, but what you think I've been talking on? Let me be very frank. The white man can't heal us. He, he can pay for what he did, but he don't have the science to heal what his fathers did in messing us up. Now, I'm going to prove it. First of all, you have to know what happened to you. <laughs> See, most of you, when you count slavery, you count it from 1619, 1620. Have you ever heard of the $64 question? The $64,000 question? Have you ever asked why 64? Why not 65? Why not 63? Why not 60? There are 64 hidden years of your history that turned you from an African into a Negro with no knowledge of your name, your language, your culture, your religion, your God, your history. That happened over a period of time where the older African parents were separated from the children. The parents killed off. And the enemy reared the children that is why you don't know anything about your past in Africa. Because if they didn't kill your mother, she would have given you your mother language. She would have taught you your mother culture. But you don't dress like your African mother dress. You dress like some freakish woman out of Paris, London, and Milan. Talk back to me, black woman. You don't know your mother's dressing room. Because if you knew your mother's dressing room, you would dress like mama dressed. But when they brought mama here, they stripped her of her robes. They stripped her of her fine garments. And they put her in a gunny sack and that kind of burlap mess. These are the years that white folk don't want to talk about because it was the most cruel thing ever done to a people to strip you totally of who you are, what you are, who your God is, what your religion is and then rear you like an animal. But still in you was the science. You built the fine mansions of the whites in the South. See, you built them. So you had to have been a builder back home, not swinging in trees. You were a builder back home. So you built the master's plantation. They brought slaves to build the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. And I don't doubt that it's slaves that built the Georgia Capitol. We're builders. We sold the white woman's dresses. We cooked the white people's food. You knew. They couldn't take it out of your nature, but your head, you couldn't remember your greatness. So if you don't know who you are or what you were, you don't know who you are. 
And if you don't know who you are, you don't know what to expect from yourself. See? Then religion, when they finally gave it to you, they gave it to you as a tool to make you a better servant of white supremacy. Please follow me. I'm not against Jesus Christ. I love Jesus with a profound passion. But I hate what they've done in his name. You hear me well. They know that Jesus was a man of color. But they made him white for their purpose. You must never see yourself in connection with divine. You must never think of yourself as a connecting link with God. You must always see that link as coming through white people. So in your mind, he's the natural ruler because he looks like Jesus. In your mind, he's the natural king because he looks like Jesus. In your mind, he's good looking because he looks like Jesus. And in that same mind, when you look in the mirror and see your black face, your nappy hair, your broad nose, and your thick lips, you say, God, why did you do this to us? See? So you are already fixed to come out of college and go to white people and look for a job. You already fixed? Not quite. Because when I heard Brother Malik asking about the verdict, <laughs> sound like somebody been unfixing somebody. <laughs> now, I want you to know that Brother Farrakhan would not waste time teaching hatred. I think they have done a masterful job. But I'm saying to you students that to look to government to repair us is looking in the wrong direction. They don't know how and if they knew how they don't have the will or the desire to repair black people. But in our unity, listen to me good now, we can force them All right. All right. to make reparations for what they've done. And Cobra can't do it by herself. In buff. And, and uh, a national black united front can't do it by itself. And as long as we are divided, they will not listen to Brother Minister Silas Muhammad. They will not listen to him. They will not listen to me. They will not listen to any of us. They will laugh. That's right. Go ahead, man. Because you have no power to bring about what you're asking for unless, unless you stop your jackass behavior and become a united people. Let me conclude. They're not going to listen. But if we speak with one mighty strength,
strong voice. They can't help it. We're 40 million or more strong in America. We've got the best educated black people in the world. Just need a little love for yourself and your people. We have nearly three quarters of a trillion dollars coming through our hands each year. You're not poor. You're just not organized and you're disconnected from one another. Now I say I'm a Muslim. That's a point of division today. Well, you say, well, I'm a Christian and, and Jesus is the man, not Mohammed. Now here we go. You Muslims, you violent berserkers, strapping bombs on yourself, killing innocent people. That Islam is a dangerous religion. Hey, hey, wait a minute. We've been among you for 75 years. <coughs> And ain't none of us strapped no bombs on ourselves, killing nobody. <coughs> and I think we got more reason to do it than the Palestinians. And imagine, imagine white people saying that. The hypocrisy of you. Here this dude comes with a cross and kills off all the indigenous people in the name of Jesus. Millions of indigenous people wiped out. He goes back over to Africa with the cross. Kill us all. In the name of Jesus. And for 300 years, he locked the Bible. We were not allowed to read it. In the name of Jesus. Now, now, you got black Baptist churches. But you all were a part of the white Baptist church first. And they didn't treat you right. So you went from first Baptist to second Baptist. Third Baptist. Zion Baptist. You were a Methodist. They didn't treat you right. And you left and became an African Methodist Episcopalian. Then the cracker lynch you with your collar on. Burn your church down because you were using your church for liberation. The Germans Prisoners of war could come to America and find more justice than the black soldiers from their white Christian brothers. It wasn't Muslims doing this to you. Hello. Hello. When you met Muslims, you met men right here in Atlanta that came to ITC and we took the Bible and you took the Bible and we start arguing with each other. And all of a sudden, black theology arose. There wasn't no black theology till you started arguing with Muslims.
You marvel at Brother Malcolm. He was a Muslim. And he educated black America. In this city, Abdul Rahman. Atlanta, Georgia. In Philadelphia, Jeremiah Shabazz. In Washington, all Elijah Muhammad's ministers were educators. Louis Farrakhan. You can never separate me from Christians. I told the Arabs, and when I first got started, I said, I will never jump over one black Christian to find brotherhood with a white Arab. Yes, I said it. Yes, I said it. I wouldn't say it like that today. I would be a lot more skillful. But my point is, I preach in Christian churches at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. Ain't no reverend gonna invite me into his church if he thinks that I'm coming there to upset his house. I don't see the church and the mosque that different. There's not a Muslim in here who doesn't love Jesus. Not one Muslim who does not love Jesus. Our holy book, Quran, refers to Jesus as the Messiah. But there are members of the Jewish community who don't believe in Jesus at all. But they are welcome and we are not. We are not. Because we don't have the money. We don't have the organizational power. And you like sycophants and like lap dogs. That's why Jesus said, you can't serve God and mammon too. You love one and you hate the other. And as long as the white man can offer you money and you bow down and sacrifice principles on the altar of profit, you're not worthy to lead your people. So I'm saying to us, I'm with us all the way to Washington to make the demand. We'll fight hard as hell to make the demand. But I'm saying to us, it ain't the white man that's stopping you. We say we demand an immediate end to police brutality and mob attacks. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Negroes know how to march the minute a white policeman kill a black brother. But every weekend, we sending each other to the morgue and ain't nobody saying nothing. How can you stop the white man's murder of you when you won't stop murdering yourself? So, in my conclusion, what they did to us rendered us dead as a people. Dead. Mentally, morally, spiritually, politically, economically, socially, 
dead. Our condition is styled in the scriptures of both Bible and Quran as the resurrection. To my Muslim family, look at these words in the Quran. The devil is talking to God. And the devil says to God, respite me till the day when they are raised. In the 75th surah of the Quran, it says, nay, I swear by the resurrection. I swear by the self-accusing spirit. A man is not awake until his own spirit accuses him when he's a wrongdoer. A moral awakening needs to happen among us. I want you to hear me because you've been looking too hard at the white man and too soft at yourself. But if we got our act together, we could force him and he would bow down. He would bow down. So, I want us, us, between now and the Million Man March commemoration, to work on ourselves. Yeah. Men are coming, but women are coming. Brothers, we have to learn to respect self, and we have to learn the value of a woman. Any society, listen, any society that puts a woman down can never be lifted up. Remember that. The Muslim world, Brother Nuruddin Faiz, my dear brother, the Muslim world needs reform. And if we are not about telling them how they must reform, then we'll go along with a program that is as dead as hell. There's no way that a woman should not be educated. There's no way that a woman shouldn't come to mosque and learn spiritual knowledge right along with the man. The prophet taught both man and woman and he taught the equality of man and woman. We must show the world a new people coming up. I am so excited over you because I see in your spirit that you are ready and the time of foolishness is over. And if our leaders don't lead right, We can't sell our people out for no privileges. I see you rising. And I only asked God when I was at the door of death, I never asked him to keep me here. When I was in my darkest hour, three minutes from death, on that table in the hospital, my daughter told me that I was in terrific pain 
And I was crying out to God, thanking Him for the life that He had given me. Thanking Him for allowing me to be a witness of the beauty of His marvelous creation. Thanking Him even for the pain that I was in. And I never asked Him to spare my life. But if that was the end of my days... Thank you, Father, for allowing me to live and to try to serve you and your people. Now, you know, when my daughter told me what I was saying, I wept. Because everybody wants to believe that they believe. But when my daughter was telling me what I said, one of my attorneys was with me at the farm and I looked so bad. He would excuse himself saying he was going to the bathroom, but he would just go and cry and wipe his eyes and come back because he thought surely Farrakhan was gone. But then one of my brothers asked him, what is the value of a deathbed confession? It has great value in a court of law because when you don't think you have any more time, then your words to God are made sincere. I know that I am a believer and I know that I put my trust completely in God. And when he allowed me to live as I believe he will, Brother Nuruddin. I believe that when he allowed me to live, it was because my work was yet undone. And I said, I don't care to see another beautiful sun rise or sunset or the changing of the seasons from winter to spring to summer to fall. I live to see you rise to be what God created you to be. And I believe that this is the year, better than any year in the past, for us to break down all walls and barriers that have separated us one from the other. And this is why Brother Malik, Zulu Shabazz, and I are on the same stage representing a return of Brother Khalid to his father, his spiritual father. And I believe that that's why I'm here with Brother Conrad because Malcolm is back. I believe that Marcus Garvey is back. Martin is back. Harriet Tubman is back. This is our time. Let's take advantage of it and be a whole people again. Thank you for listening and may God bless you as I greet you in peace. Assalamu alaikum. Brothers and sisters, sister is going to close us out with prayer. Could you hold your places for just one moment of prayer? And as you leave, why don't you shake your brother and your sister's hand and let's start breaking down walls and barriers that separate us from one another. Sister. I greet you with peace. My name is Susan Mitchell. I'm the co-pastor of San Kofi United Church. Let us all assume an attitude of prayer. Our God, our creator, we are so grateful, so very grateful for the presence of your divine spirit and the one prophet you have sent to speak to us today. 
the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And God, we are so grateful that we can now say, once we were blind, but now we can see. And God, we ask that as we leave this place, you help us, oh God, to walk like the divine warriors that we are, that we stand against any form of oppression, oh God, and that while we are in these yet to be United States, oh God, we stand united as Africans, oh God, created in your own image, wonderfully and beautifully made. God, we feel your presence in this place and we recognize the divine in each and every person in here, oh God. Help us to be the warriors that you have created us to be. And we will be forever so grateful to give you the praise, to give you the honor that you are due, oh God. We say together, Ashe, Ashe. Amen, amen, and shalom to all. Thank you.